Welcome to the IDP show. I'm your host, Evan Ronda, literally in my mom's basement, and I am joined by the one, the only, Joey the Tooth. Joey, I am honored to have you join me on the preview pod this week. It is an absolute pleasure to record once again with you, taking it back to the good old days when we used to do preview pods together. Man, it's been a while. Uh, normally, I do like a cold open where I'll jump right into the meat of the episode, but it's been long enough. I got to ask you how things been, how you been doing, how's the season going for you so far? Uh, season's going good. I'm a 49ers fan, so even if fantasy football wasn't doing well, I'm still pretty pumped. Uh Overall, fantasy has actually been very good to me. A lot of the guys that I uh, kind of rode as my sleepers for the year have really kind of broken out a little bit, so it's that's really been helpful. But uh, yeah, season overall is well. I'm doing good in the Scott Fishbowl. I'm good, doing good in the IDP Guys Invitational. Uh, all the tournaments that I'm in, I've actually done quite well, so I'm happy. been putting my weekly article out at footballguys.com. Got my projections going. It's good, man. It's a good year. You love to see it. I just got handed my first loss in the IDP Invitational because I forgot to sub out Deshaun Watson for anybody else. And uh, that's all right. It happens. That's what happens when you are busy during kickoff. So I will take my L's. Yeah, and in too many leagues. Call me out, will you? I'm the same way. Trust me. I've done it. Well, hey, honestly, at this point, anything in football could happen. But as long as my guy Terrell Bernard keeps balling out, I'm fine. Am I right? Oh my gosh, well, he's killing it. Absolutely. Okay, enough chit-chat. Let's get right into the meat of this episode here because you and I both have one thing in common, and that is we came to absolutely destroy this start-sit episode. So our first game of the week is the Thursday night game, and we have the Denver Broncos at the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, I'm going to go ahead and take the visiting teams. You're going to go ahead and take the home team. So I've got the Broncos here, and the Chiefs offense is a pretty strong matchup for linebackers. It's the fourth best matchup for linebackers here. So would you be shocked if I told you to start a linebacker? No, probably not. Well, great, because I'm going to tell you to start Josie Jewell. So first of all, of course, it's a great matchup, and he's also had really solid usage and great grades. Now, he only had a 12% tackle efficiency so far this season, but I'm expecting that to regress positively just because I know he's a talented player. He's been dealing with some injuries. He was a little bit limited last week. I'm expecting him to step back into that full-time role and be a productive player for this team. Now, a guy that I'm not necessarily expecting to be as productive of a player is Kareem Jackson. Now, He had a great week last week. I'm not going to take that away from him, but safeties are really inconsistent. And honestly, Jackson's just been a little too efficient given his usage. So he, he like, he's got no pass for us upside. He's got zero chance to get a sack unless like a miracle happens because they're not intentionally using him as a blitzer. And I just don't like gambling on a player getting an interception. So if you're the kind of manager that looks at, like how many points a player has scored so far this season or just last week. And that process leads you to think about starting Kareem Jackson. I would just encourage you to look elsewhere because this might not be the week that he continues to go off. If you will, I will also say, keep an eye out for Baron Browning. It's not a great matchup for defensive ends, but he could be available in your league because he's still coming off of IR And after just trading away, um, what's his face? Randy Randy Gregory. Gregory? Yeah. After just trading away, Randy Gregory looked at, they've got some opportunities for some snaps here for some edge rushers and Baron Browning had a really strong stint last season. So there's a chance he continues to ball out when he comes back healthy. Yeah. I I like the call. I like Baron Browning coming back. I think, uh, getting rid of Randy Gregory really opens up the door. I mean, Nick Benito has been playing fantastic for the Broncos this year, and it's kind of been very quietly. Nobody's really talking about him too too much, but uh, the, even this last game, I think he had two sacks this last game. He had a sack and a half the game before, and he's just been absolutely balling. So you have Benito mixed in with another revelation, Jonathan Cooper, and then bringing Baron Browning. That defensive line's fantastic. But uh, I'm going to dive into uh, the Chiefs here, and um, – 
I'm going to say I know it's not a great matchup wise. I know the, uh, the defensive ends don't really score much for the against the Broncos, but Mike Dana, he's been uh, he's been kind of a revelation for the Chiefs, right? Like he's been with the team for a few years now. He hasn't really broken out much, but to start this season so far, he has 18 tackles, three and a half sacks, and uh, 14 pressures on the season. Uh, the Broncos have given up 16 sacks this season. That's that's good for I think it's tied for sixth place in the league. Um, and Mike Dan, he plays a ton of snaps. He's got a 78% snap share on the season. So uh, in IDP, we know volume is key. So I'm starting Mike Dana this week. Um, to sit, I'm going to sit both safeties, Justin Reed and Brian Cook. I mean, Nick Bolton is likely going to come back this week. Um, the Broncos give up, I think it's the third least points to safety. So with all the, the tackle volume being swallowed up in front of him with Bolton back, I just don't see either of Cook or Reed being a viable option this week. Yeah, I'm with you there. In fact, I just finished placing, not during the episode, I promise I'm not doing this during the episode, but I just finished placing an underdog prop on the Nick Bolton over seven and a half combined tackles. So here's to hoping that pans out. But uh, you were just talking about Mike Dana, and I'm looking here at his PFF true pass at win rate, 14.1%. That is that is strong. That's third on the team behind only Chris Jones and George Karloftis. And that's a great place to be. So I'm with you here. I really agree that, you know, maybe they haven't generated a lot of points for defensive ends. But honestly, you can just kind of say, screw that. Like, I'm going to gamble on a sack. And with a strong pass at win rate. Yeah, like <laughs> it seems pretty possible that a sack could be coming in. So let's go ahead and jump into our next game here. Now, this is another Sunday morning London game with the Baltimore Ravens at the Tennessee Titans. Now, the guy that I'm going to mention as my first player here is actually going to be to Devion Clowney because the Titans offense as a matchup is the second most advantageous matchup for defensive ends. Well, would you look at that? Devion Clowney is a defensive end, and I'm telling you to start him. I think at this point, now six weeks into the season, Listeners have a pretty good idea for what my process is, so I don't really need to go into great detail there other than just to say that he's been playing pretty well this season, and it's kind of surprising. Like, I don't know why I'm that surprised by it, but I am. He's currently looking at a 17.5% true pass at win rate, which is very impressive, especially just considering the kind of a player that he is. Um, but a player that has a 0.1% higher true pass at win rate than him on the same team is Odafe Owe. Now, I know he's been dealing with some injuries so far, but if he's healthy this week, he's also another player that I'm going to mention as a start because he's also, obviously, like I just mentioned, got a really, really solid true pass at win rate. And I think in this matchup, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for points being scored just here against the Titans. So I'm just hoping that he's not super limited when he comes back. So just watch the press conferences from the coaches. And just, you know, follow the beat reporters. If you see someone mention that he's going to be worked back slowly, I would give it a little bit before you start him. But if he's going to be thrust right back into that role that he had previously, boom, fire him up. Yeah, uh, when I I write the uh, streaming defensive line article for football guys every week, and uh, I almost every week look to see who's playing the Tennessee Titans because it's almost a matchup you want to try to exploit every week, so. If you're picking defensive ends against him, I'm I'm with you on every every step of it. <laughs> but uh, uh, let's go to the Titans. Um, uh, I'm going to start Amani Hooker this week. Amani Hooker is somebody who's actually his usage has kind of surprised me uh, so far this season. He's played 65 percent of his snaps either in the slot or in the box. I thought that would be more of Kevin Byard's uh, spot because that's where he's been playing mostly in his career. Um, but they get the the run heavy uh, Ravens with the mobile Lamar Jackson, uh, Amani Hooker play, with a usage in the slot in the box as well as his playmaking ability. He's got great ball skills. I think he could come away with some high tackle numbers and the possibility of an interception because we've seen Jackson make some questionable decisions with the ball at times. Um, and I'm also going to sit Aziz Al Shair. I know he's been kind of a he was the off season guy that everybody was like, well, he's going to have his breakout year and he has played well, but the, uh, the Ravens give up the second fewest points to linebackers. And I know he has 47 tackles on the season in five games, but only 22 of those are solo tackles. So he's around the ball, but he's 
more often than not finishing up a tackle as opposed to finish and as opposed to making his own. Yeah, Joe, you know what I'm going to do here? I'm going to be I'm going to be honest with the listeners. I've I've set you up in a bad situation because now I'm looking through our our prep doc here and I have linebacker second. I have it highlighted in red. I should have this highlighted in green because <laughs> this Ravens offense as a matchup is actually really really strong for linebackers and I know just based on that alone you would probably change Aziz Alshayer from a sit to a start. Is that probably the case? Yeah, I mean it would it would definitely sway my decision. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm just, hey, how about what if I just like give you wrong information and then throw you live on a podcast and see how you do? Ah, bummer. Um, so yeah, sorry about that. But That's quite I, right. I agree. I, I think um, I think this is this matchup could definitely impact. Obviously, being second worst to second best is going to have a big impact on how we see Aziz Alshair. So in that case, I think uh, I'll change that to start Jack Gibbons because Ooh. Jack Gibbons has actually been playing very well recently. And uh, I actually think he's been playing better than Al Shair. He's actually coming up with a lot more solo tackles. I mean, Shair's around the ball. Like 47 tackles in five games is almost 10 tackles a game, but only less than half of them are solo tackles. So if you have a, if you're in a league where they score solos more, a lot more than assisted tackles, then Gibbons might be your play here. I like it. I like it, man. Look at you thinking on the fly. Love to see it. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump into the Washington Commanders at the Atlanta Falcons. Now, this is the first game of the main slate on Sunday. And oh, my gosh, this is the battle of the terrible offensive lines. Mm. So for starters, I'm going to talk about the commanders here. And I'm going to mention that the Falcons as a matchup have. OK, I should clarify this. I don't think that the Falcons have a bad offensive line, but I do know that they generate the fourth most points to defensive ends. Now, could that just be because they're providing a lot of tackle opportunities? Maybe. But regardless, that's what the numbers say. So I'm going to listen to the numbers. But before I actually talk about the defensive ends that I do like in this matchup, I have to give a shout out to Percy Butler, the commander's backup safety, because unfortunately, Derek Forrest was placed on IR. Forrest is the only other safety to play defensive snaps alongside Cameron Curl. So it's really just those three. It's Percy Butler, Derek Forrest, and Cameron Curl, and nobody else. So with Forrest out, Percy Butler's the guy. He's the only one left. Now, I'll kind of temper expectations here a little bit too because he hasn't graded super well. He's got like a 5% tackle efficiency on the season. So I know it's not really a glowing review, but he's going to be a full-time safety for at least the next four weeks. So if maybe not start him, at least consider adding him and then you know play it by ear from there if you have a good matchup. But... I'll still give you two starts just because I said I would. And so I'm going to tell you, you have to keep starting Chase Young and Montez Sweat. Like, please, for the love of God, keep leaving them in your starting lineup, especially in this matchup because it's such a strong matchup. Chase Young is back better than ever. I feel like I talk about this every single episode, but I can't say it enough. Nobody should be surprised at how good Chase Young is playing right now. Like, to be completely honest, if anybody is looking at this, like, Chase Young is some kind of a revelation. I just feel like maybe they kind of forgot like who the heck he was coming out of college or why he hasn't been producing in the meantime, but he's here. He's legit. And he's going to continue to score points. Yeah, even his rookie season was a good season. I think people just forget how good Chase Young really is. And it's never really been a matter of his talent level. It's just been being healthy. So it's just, it's nice to see him coming back to form. So, but yeah, uh, Commanders and Falcons are actually two teams that I also look at when looking to stream for the week. So I actually have them written up in this week too. Um, so for the Falcons, uh, I actually am saying I'm going to say start David Onyemata. He's a uh, he was he's always been pretty solid with the uh, with the Saints leading up to this season. Um, the Commanders have given their offensive line has given up 29 sacks in the season. Uh, Onyemata he only has a sack and a half in the season, but uh, he does have an 84.2 pass rush grade. So he he is he is providing a lot of pressure. And um, I just think against this commander's offensive line, he's going to collapse that pocket terribly. And poor Sam Howell, man. Sam Howell's he's a he, I feel like he's a good quarterback. He just has not had time. I mean, they've given up 29 sacks in five games. That's absolutely un unheard of. That's terrible, unless you're the New York Giants, but we'll get to that later. 
Um, second start's going to be um, Bud Dupree. I wanted to say Arnold Ebicchetti here, but he just – he literally does not create pressure. So I, I went with Bud Dupree instead. Uh, he's also the highest volume edge defender for the Falcons. Uh, he plays 70%. And he's he's a little older, but uh, he does have some pass rush pedigree in the past. I know his his numbers have have dipped a bit this season, but the matchup's just too good not to start Bud Dupree and David Onyemata. Totally agree. I actually called out Bud Dupree earlier this week on a podcast as far as a like a super deep defensive line streamer. Like this matchup's just too good not to start him. So I love both of these calls. It's it's very difficult to look at what Sam Howell is doing behind that offensive line and say, yeah, no, I don't want a part of that. So right. <laughs> totally agree with you there. Let's go ahead and move on to the Minnesota Vikings at the Chicago bears. And so the first game I'm going to talk about here is Mark Davenport. I've been hyping him up for a while now, as far as a guy that I believe is more talented than I believe the market believes he is. And I think that he's been showing that in his first two weeks back now that he's actually healthy, you know, crossing my fingers that he stays healthy. But this is a really, really nice matchup for defensive ends. It's the third best. And Marcus Davenport has had really, really strong weeks back to back, which you love to see. And so I think he's going to continue to roll here against the Bears. Now, a guy that I'm a little bit less confident in is Jordan Hicks. Now, I know he had an insanely good week last week, like so good, but that was last week, and this is this week. And the Chicago Bears are the 29th best matchup against linebackers, and Jordan Hicks has been a volatile asset so far this season. He's had some good weeks. He's had some bad ones. And frankly, all I'm looking at here is just this matchup. Now, it depends on the depth of your league. Obviously, I understand, you know, if you've got like four starting linebackers, maybe you're not just going to chuck them on your bench for a nobody, but maybe the best strategy you can do here is just kind of look at his average performance throughout the season and then just give that a bit of a downgrade. And if that score is still good enough to merit beating, being in your starting lineup, then great. Leave them in your starting lineup. But if you have some other players that you like a little bit more than whatever that number comes out to be, then you can go ahead and start those other guys instead. Yeah, I, I really like the uh, Marcus Davenport call there. Uh, he's actually in my streaming article this week. I, I love to, I, You'd love to see these guys who've, like Chase Young too, these guys who had this, this pedigree coming out of college, this expectation. I mean, Davenport's just, he, everybody's kind of written him off at this point. He's just never lived up to his expectation with the Saints, and it's nice to see him with a fresh start actually producing and playing well. So it's good to see. Good for you, Davenport. But uh, moving to the Bears, uh, I'm going to start a cornerback here, uh, rookie Tyreek Stevenson. Um, coming out of Miami, he was uh, actually one of the best, better uh, press corners coming into this year's draft class uh, the going against the Vikings, they've attempted the most pass attempts in the NFL so far this year. Um, Justin Jefferson might be out, but uh, they still have Jordan Addison, KJ Osborne. So they're going to throw a lot on the outside. So Tyreek Stevenson's going to be busy. Uh, same thing happened last week. Uh, he actually against the commanders, he had nine tackles. He was targeted heavily. So I, I think the rookie could be in for another good week. Um, I'm also going to consider sitting Tremaine Edmonds. Uh, the Vikings are in the bottom third of the NFL in points allowed to linebackers. Uh, he's got his running mate, TJ Edwards, who is the volume tackler around. And uh, Tremaine Edmonds, he hasn't really produced much playmaking stats this year, if any. I mean, sure, he's still been pretty good in coverage, but he hasn't really produced anything. So when you have Edwards eating into all your tackle volume and you're not producing any playmaking stats and you're going up in a, into a bad matchup, I'd consider sitting Jermaine Edmonds. Yeah, it's a really tough situation to be in, especially considering what managers likely paid to acquire him. But sometimes you just got to cut your losses and, and pick your spots when it comes to starting guys. And I know Tremaine Edmonds is going to have his weeks, especially in those advantageous matchups. But if you're in a shallow enough league, like you're only starting one or two linebackers and you've got other options. And I know there are managers that fit this definition because well, frankly, they ask us questions and we'll answer them later on in this episode. That's that's going to be the kind of situation. But again, I'm sure managers that are in those four or five linebacker start leagues know he's probably got to stay in. Yeah. Yeah, those deep leagues, which the fun leagues to play, but those deep leagues, uh, you, you kind of have to. Exactly. 
All right, let's go ahead and jump into the Seattle Seahawks at the Cincinnati Bengals. And the first player I'm going to mention here is Boye Mafe. What a fun guy. What a fun name. I remember doing some analysis on him coming out last season for the draft, and I just I just remember the name. It sticks. But uh, this is going to be more of a deeper league start simply because I like his underlying stable metrics. That, that true pass set win rate is something that I like to look at whenever doing these weekly preview pods, just because I believe it's a I believe it's a strong predictive metric, right? Defensive line is one of those positions where skill really reflects your production at the end of the year, more so than it does with other positions. And right now, Boye Mafe is leading the entire team in true pass set win rate, which is he's at almost 30%. It's 29.5%. And that's not off of a very, very small sample size. Like that's 88 pass rush snaps, which is impressive to say the least. And so if you're in a deeper league where you're starting like four or five defensive linemen, I think you can look at Boye Mafe as a guy that is potentially in consideration for your starting lineup, just depending on how stacked your team is at that position. Um, but a guy that I'm less confident in here is Julian Love. I know he's been great so far this season. He's been putting up a ton of points, and I'm happy that he has been so good so far. However, Jamal Adams is now back from his concussion, and that's almost certainly going to hurt uh, Julian Love's usage. Now, Technically, I said this already last time Jamal Adams was coming back, but then he played like a few snaps, like three, maybe, and then got a concussion. So you might be saying, "Whoa, hold on, Evan. Didn't you just tell me that? And then Julian Love scored a bunch of points. Yeah, yeah. But the whole point of me saying that was because Jamal Adams was supposed to play the entirety of the game. Now that I do expect him to play the entirety of the game, fingers crossed, that's almost certainly going to hurt Julian Love's usage. Yeah, it's uh, I, I love Boy, Mafe actually, he, he he was kind of a, a sleeper coming out of the draft, I felt like, and he, he's just been strong. He had a kind of a, it seemed like a weak uh, rookie season, but he actually played quite well. He just didn't have the sack numbers. He's, he actually, uh, I think he ended up with 30 or more tackles last season. So his, his run defense was good. He just needed to, to work on his pass rush. And it sounds like he actually has, and he's one of the more impressive uh, pass rushers on the team. So good to see there. Um, going with the Bengals. It's going to be two sits for me here because there's when you're playing the Seahawks, there's not much to love about IDP. They don't really give up much IDP at all unless you're a linebacker. Um, so I'm going to say sit Dax Hill. Dax Hill has been great this season. He's everything we've been hoping for for the replacement for Jesse Bates, but he comes in against the Seahawks. Geno Smith has attempted. Uh, he's in the bottom five in pass attempts in the league. Uh, Dax Hill plays heavy free safety snap, so – literally he plays the Jesse Bates role. So Seahawks given up, uh, I think it's the third or second word, second least amount of points to safeties this season. So Dax Hill, he's a big sit for me this week. Um, also, if you play in leagues that um, are defensive tackle required leagues, uh, I'm sitting BJ Hill this week. Um, the Seahawks give up the 30th most points to defensive tackles in the league. Uh, he's been solid this year, but he has showed some age. And uh, in a bad matchup, he's a guy I'm just going to sit. Yeah, and there's actually so I've been looking on these on these preview episodes about their pass rush win rate. But another stat that I kind of forgot that existed that I could look at also is their run stop percentage because. You also get points for, you know, tackles for a loss and stuff like that. So looking at BJ Hill's run stop percentage, he's at 2.2%, which means absolutely nothing to you until I give you some context. Sam Hubbard is at 11.5%. Miles Murphy's at 7.7%. Trey Hendrickson is at 7.2%. I understand those guys are edge rushers, but DJ Reader's at 6.0%. It like the median, like I'm looking at it somewhere between like, you know, six and 10%. And guys that are above that are really, really good. And guys that are below that aren't great. And so far, BJ Hill um, is leading. Well, okay, he's leading the defensive tackles, but he's second on the team in snaps in run defense. And that 2.2 run stop percentage is not exactly the most encouraging metric to see for him. So I agree. This is, again, not a great matchup. And in a situation that you would probably like to look elsewhere. Let's go ahead and move on to your... San Francisco 49ers at the Cleveland Browns. Really, what I should have done here is just had a swap so you could take the 49ers, but it's okay. I'll give them all glowing reviews so that you feel good about them. 
Um, now, listeners, I'm sure you guys are probably already starting Javon Hargrave and the linebackers and Talanoa Hufanga, but just in case you're not, do that because the Browns offense is the second best matchup against defensive tackles, the fifth best matchup against linebackers, and the fifth best matchup against safeties, which is awesome. You really like to see that. You want your good players to score lots of points, uh, but because you still probably need something actionable and me telling you to start all your good players is probably not very helpful. I will also tell you to start Eric Armstead because he's had a really strong snap share. And he obviously this is a great matchup for defensive tackles, but he's actually been playing very well this season too. If I look at his uh, true pass set win rate, he is at that's run stop percentage, but I can pull that up too, I guess. Uh, he is at 2.0%, which is not the best thing to see, but that's not really what I'm looking at here because I'm looking for sacks. And his true pass set win rate is all the way up at 24.3%. Now, yes, is that partially due to the fact that he is on an offensive line where he's just not getting double teamed as often because it's so talented? Yes. However, does fantasy football care? Not even a little bit. And so if he's winning and he's getting sacks, he's going to get points. And that's ultimately what matters. Yeah, uh, I love what the 49ers have done this season, adding Javon Hargrave to that defensive line. So you have Hargrave, Bosa, Armstead, and, and now Randy Gregory coming over. So Gregory, uh, Drake Jackson, it's fantastic. I'm just very excited. I love Eric Armstead. I've loved Eric Armstead. I always thought he was miscast when he first came here and I tried to put him on the edge. But as soon as he got back to the interior, he's been fantastic. Um, but let's look at the Browns, um, sit everybody. They're going to lose terribly. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. I just had to, um, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I would start Anthony Walker this week. I think JOK, uh, Jeremiah Wusakoromora, he's kind of like the, the linebacker. Now he showed the past two weeks that he's the linebacker you want to start, but I think I want to play Anthony Walker this week too. Um, the 49ers do still run the ball a lot. They do run a lot over the middle. Um, his snap share is down. It's only at 70%, but he does still average five tackles a game. And, uh, the 49ers offense kind of does cater to linebackers a little bit. Um, and something I'm kind of reluctant to say, but I actually, if this only comes if, if you have a lot of options on your team on the edge, uh, consider sitting miles Garrett. I know he's one of the top three edge defenders in the league and you should never sit him. You always always start your studs, but if you're a guy who really drafted heavy on the edge position and you have other options, I mean, the 49ers have given up the least amount of sacks in the league. Their scheme does a great job of negating pass rush. I mean, with, with quick screens, with quick hits over the middle, a lot of motion, uh, zone reads in the run game. It's just, it doesn't cater to edge defenders at all. So if you have other good options, consider sitting miles Garrett, just consider it. I'm not saying do it, but if you have other options, there's a very good potential. Miles Garrett does not put up any points this week. That was probably the best way you could have phrased that. Just considering who you're talking about. Uh, I will also say that the 49ers offense as a matchup is like literally the worst in the league for cornerbacks. So if you were planning on starting Denzel Ward this week, maybe just don't think about somebody else. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and move on here to the new Orleans saints at the Houston Texans. Now, the first guy I'm going to mention here is Alante Taylor. Sheesh, talk about sitting cornerbacks. The Texans offense is the 29th best matchup for cornerbacks. And so Alante Taylor is going to be a guy that I unfortunately am going to recommend that you sit. Now, I know he's Addy's guy. I just mentioned him as a start previously, and he's been up and down the season. But look, here's how it works. In cornerback required leagues or even in non-cornerback required leagues, like you got to play your matchups. And there are so many options available as far as defensive backs go that really you have no reason to start a guy in a bad matchup. And so just sit him, hold them, do whatever you got to do. But really the only situation where I'd probably keep him in my lineup is if you're in one of those leagues where you're starting like two or three or more cornerbacks, in which case, well, maybe you don't have that many other options, in which case I would understand and I'll give you a pass. But just keep in mind, this is not a great matchup for him. Somebody I will tell you to start, or at least keep your eye on, is Marcus May, because he is returning from his suspension for the Saints, and frankly, he's back. I mentioned him on the IDP Game Theory podcast earlier this week in that he has a pretty solid tackle floor, 
or at least has had so far this season, especially for a deep safety. And he even has some pass rush upside because they use him as a blitzer from time to time. But really what I'm also saying is that you should be sitting Jordan Howden. Now, the only people that were probably considering starting Jordan Howden were my friends that are Saints fans. But even still, he probably should not be in a starting lineup anymore just considering that his starting role is gone. Yeah, I like all I like both of those. Uh looking at the Texans, uh, I'm gonna say start Jonathan Greenard. I wanted to pick a an edge rusher here, but I feel like Will Anderson's kind of the guy that most people are starting on a weekly basis, even though Jonathan Greenard has almost been the more productive player. Um the Saints have allowed the fourth most sacks in the league. Um Greener plays ample volume. He's got a sixty seven percent snap share. Uh he's got nineteen tackles and three sacks through five games. Uh, he's actually played very well this season. So uh, in a good matchup, I'm going to play start Jonathan Greenard. And I'm also starting, and I never actually nailed his name. Is it Henry Tuo Tuo? So you just, it's like Spanish where all the vowels just make the same sound. A, E, O, U. So it's just To'o To'o. To'o. All right. Henry To'o To'o. Yeah. So I know the, the Saints don't really give up much points to linebackers, but he's been the only constant on the team for the last four games that's been relevant in any sort of linebacker situation. So it's kind of funny because he's a rookie and he, there's actually quite a few guys that have been mixing into the rotation, but it's been To'o, To'o that's actually been the, the most productive. He's had seven or more tackles in the last four games and uh, somebody on that team has to make a tackle in the middle of the field. So I, I think he's a guy you're going to fire up. I love these. I love any opportunity I get to say Henry To'o To'o's name, I will take. And uh, look, I just I just took another one right there. Um, <laughs> I'll also mention, um, shoot, Nate, like the linebacker situation on this team is so funky. Denzel Perriman working back from injury. Blake Cashman getting a ton of snaps last week, but he's probably going to be, you know, a bench asset going forward. Um, yeah. We, yeah, we don't really need to spend too much more time talking about this. Here's the crazy thing with Henry. Like, he's been grading pretty poorly, but I know he's going to keep getting playing time just because the coaches want him out there. Um, so there's not really anything actionable from that. It's just just a note. Like, he's not exactly a great player yet. I'm hoping he continues to get better. Right. Um, but again, like, your fantasy team doesn't care because he's scoring points. All right. Let's go ahead and move on here to the Indianapolis Colts at the Jacksonville Jaguars. So here's the deal. The Jaguars offense is the fourth best matchup for defensive tackles and the third best matchup for linebackers. We're now 33 minutes into this episode. Listeners, if you don't know what I'm about to tell you already, are you even paying attention? Like, I'm going to tell you to start defensive tackles. I'm going to tell you to start linebackers. Or am I? I'm actually throwing a curveball here because I'm going to say to sit EJ speed if Shaquille Leonard is back. Now, it looks like he's returning because I just looked at the practice report and he practiced today. So that probably means he's playing. And if he does, then EJ speed snap share will go back down. So the only situation where you're actually going to start EJ speed is if you were already starting him before the Shaquille Leonard injury when he was playing a part time role, but still scoring points. If you were starting him then then you can expect that same level of production with maybe a slight boost. But if you're expecting a full-time role in like 10 tackles, I would ask you what you're thinking because uh, that's just, that's simply not going to happen with the, with a limited workload. Now, if Shaquille Leonard is out, oh my gosh, fire up EJ speed. Don't even think twice. I just, I think Shaquille Leonard's going to play. So I'm not going to tell you to do that. Another guy I will tell you to start though, is Grover Stewart. And I guess obviously by default DeForest Buckner, because these guys both play on the interior of that defensive line. And they both have really great stable metrics too. When I say stable metrics, I just mean like skill measurements, basically true pass at win rate, run stop percentage. Uh, just looking at this Colts defensive line, DeForest Buckner as an interior defensive lineman has an 18.8% true pass at win rate. Grover Stewart's at 17.1. Those are both like those are both great for edge rushers and they're doing that from the interior of the f defensive line, which is really, really great to see. You know what else is great to see? Grover Stewart has an 11.2 run stop percentage. DeForest Buckner has a 9.4% run stop percentage. So 
These guys are great in both phases of the game, and they're in a very favorable matchup. So there's really no reason why you would be keeping them on your bench unless you're in a really, really shallow league. That's pretty crazy to see Grover Stewart's pass rush win rate. He's never really known for his pass rushing, but I mean, if he can add that to his game, that's that's impressive. Um, so I was going to originally say um, start one cor- uh, safety and sit one safety for the Jags, but I was going to say sit Rayshon Jenkins, but I'm going to I'm going to shift here and I'm going to say sit Trayvon Walker. Trayvon Walker, he, he's kind of I mean, first of all, we'll start the Colts give up the. Th- 30th most points to defensive end. So it's definitely a matchup you want to avoid. Um, Trayvon Walker's also, he's never lived up to that first overall hype. I mean, we kind of all felt that way when we saw him get drafted over Aiden Hutchinson. And it's just shown Aiden Hutchinson has been the better player for their career. And Trayvon Walker's never lived up to that athleticism that everybody thought was going to translate into this premier pass rusher. I mean, he's got 15 tackles and two sacks on the season. I mean, it's, it's pedestrian and it's in a bad matchup. So you're just, you want to sit Trayvon Walker this week. I am going to say start Andre Cisco of the safeties. So I know he's the deep safety, but I have a feeling that the Jaguars are going to come into this game and kind of beat up on the Colts, Colts a little bit. And uh, it's going to force the Colts to throw a little more. And I think it could possibly lead to Gardner Minshew pushing the ball downfield a little bit. And uh, Cisco has been really good at ball hawking this year. He's, he's been able to come out with a lot of big plays. So I think this would be a week that you could see him maybe just come up with a few tackles, but also possibly come away with a big play. All right. Here, here's a question for you. I'm going to put you on the spot. So mm. sorry in advance. Would you be as bold as to say potentially sit Josh Allen this week? <sighs> I mean, it's a terrible matchup. I'm not going to, I'm I'm, I'm still going to play Josh Allen just because I do think that the Jaguars are going to be up big and it's going to force a lot of pass passing situations. So it's going to give them a lot of pass rush opportunity. And Josh Allen is easily the better pass rusher over Trayvon Walker. So he's a guy, I think he's going to have opportunity. So I'm going to say still start Josh Allen, but definitely sit Trayvon Walker. Yeah, I I think I agree with you there. A couple thoughts in addition there. Number one, Josh Allen has a 30, no, wrong guy, a 22.2% true pass set, pass rush win rate, which is an absolute mouthful to say, but uh, that's very, very impressive to see. You know what else is interesting to see here? Trayvon Walker is up at 9.4% in his run stop percentage. So I'm thinking maybe I'm hating on Trayvon Walker a little bit too much. Oh, and his true pass set win rate has actually gone up to 14.3%, which is also really cool to see because not three weeks ago, he was at like 0%. No, no, I'm getting him mixed up with uh, Tyree Wilson. So totally ignore that second part. But <laughs> the uh, they were very similar assets, though, if you think about it, like yeah. highly drafted, athletic freaks, developmental prospects. I'm not totally out on Trayvon Walker. Like for this week, I totally understand, like, sit him. But I'm thinking, you know, He's doing exactly what we expected him to do. I just feel like managers are getting a little disappointed because he's not Aiden Hutchinson. Because right, I mean, I guess Aiden Hutchinson is like doing some stuff this year, apparently. So, you know, I guess I can understand why they would come to that sentiment. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and move on here to the Carolina Panthers at the Miami Dolphins. Wow. All right. The 13 and a half point spread. That's that's pretty significant. So I'll give you a couple quick metrics here. It's it's a bad matchup on the Panthers' side, right? Going up against the Dolphins' offense, it's a bad matchup for the entire defensive line. It's the 29th for defensive tackles, 31st for defensive ends. However, it is the best matchup for safeties, which is pretty cool to see. So would I tell you to bench Brian Burns? Probably not. It's really hard to bench players that are that good, but I absolutely can tell you to bench Derek Brown, so I will. You should probably bench Derek Brown if you need to. Um, obviously I understand there are some situations where you need to put him in, but I'm going to trust at this point that managers understand how to contextualize our start sits for their own league. If you don't understand how to do that, well, you know where to find me, <laughs> not at my house, please. That'd be creepy, but or uh, somebody, <laughs> yeah, pretty much, uh, some, somebody I will tell you to start though, is Sam Franklin jr. Now who is Sam Franklin jr. You might ask, well, great question. He's the starting safety for the Panthers now that Xavier Woods has been injured. 
he's also the guy that got that like 100 yard pick six like a week or two ago. And he's been playing pretty well in his uh, time filling in for them. So really what I'm telling you this for is just because I know that you're already starting Von Bell and I can't tell you to start Von Bell. So I'm going to tell you to start the other safety instead because he's also getting great usage. And like I said, this is the number one matchup for safeties here against the Dolphins offense. So if you were never, let me rephrase that. If you were ever going to start Sam Franklin, this is the week to do it. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big Sam Franklin fan. He He's just been killing it since he filled in for Xavier Woods. So I keep firing him up. Uh, on the Dolphins side, I would say start a safety, but you're already starting Javon Holland. And uh, I'm just not overly fond of Deshaun Elliott. I mean, he's been playing well, but I want to go a different direction here. Um, I'm going to say start uh, Van Ginkle. Andrew Van Ginkle, he's been very good this year. Surprisingly, uh, he's got 22 tackles and four sacks in five games. Uh, he plays a lot more when the team is in nickel. He plays the, the uh, off ball linebacker position. And uh, I think they're going to be in nickel a lot this week because I think the Dolphins are going to go up huge on the Panthers. So it's going to be a lot of passing situations. So the Panthers have also they're tied for eighth in the league in sacks allowed. So this could be another good week for Van Ginkle to get a couple of tackles and come away with a sack. And also, uh, to go along with that, I'm going to say sit David Long because he's the linebacker that comes off of the field in nickel situations. And uh, he only has a 68% snap share on the season. And if they're going to play predominantly in the nickel this game, then he's a guy that I'm going to want to sit. I will also mention Jalen Phillips has been limited in practice this week. So there's a chance he comes back healthy. And we haven't actually seen a game with Jalen Phillips healthy for the entirety of the game and David Long playing the entirety of the game. They've kind of been mutually exclusive. So I think there is still some yet to be determined here because basically it was Jalen Phillips healthy week one, Andrew Van Ginkle played off ball linebacker, then Jalen Phillips got hurt. So Andrew Van Ginkle moved up to fill in for him and then David Long filled in for Van Ginkle at off ball linebacker and they've just been kind of doing this dance ever since. But as soon as Jalen Phillips returns, like we're back into no man's land. Like, I don't know if David Long is going to maintain that kind of role. I don't know where, what they're going to do with Van Ginkle. So in the meantime, I totally agree with you. David Long is a sit. Van Ginkle scores points either way because he's been on the field in both situations. So I also agree with that call out for him as a start. All right, let's go ahead and move in to the New England Patriots at the Las Vegas Raiders. The most exciting game of the week. Is that what you just said? Wow. It's a hot take. Um, <laughs> this is the first of the Sunday afternoon games. Now, I will say the Raiders offense as a matchup gives a slight bump up to all defensive linemen. So start your Patriots defensive linemen. And in fact, now that I mentioned that, I'm going to tell you, start Anthony Jennings. Now, Anthony Jennings, where the heck did he come from? Why am I telling you to start this guy? Well, here's the deal. Matthew Judon got injured a couple weeks ago, and because he got hurt, I was very sure that, you know, Josh Uche and Keon White would increase in snap share, and they'd start to get some work. And, uh, nope, Anthony Jennings just stepped into the number one role at edge and actually played pretty well. So I'm going to tell you to keep firing him up here in a strong matchup because he's had good efficiency. And I think he could be a pretty solid start in deeper leagues. No, I'm not going to tell you to start him over a guy that's a bona fide stud in like a one or a two defensive line start league. But as like a DL4 or a DL5, if you need a guy off waivers as a streamer and you are kind of hurting at the position, you could do worse than Anthony Jennings. You could also do better than Jabril Peppers this week because the Raiders offense is the 27th best matchup for safeties which isn't not great to see. So Jabil Preppers, I mean, like he's not coming off a great week, so you're probably not too tempted to throw him into your starting lineup. And I know Bill Belichick defenses, it's really hard to trust consistency because he just gives different guys snaps every single week. So, hey, maybe even that's a little bit of a concern for Anthony Jennings too, but I'll trust that he gets some work. But for Jabril Peppers, I'm just not so sure that this is going to be the week where he gets a lot of work and is super efficient and he's in your lineup. So just... You know, if you've got him on your team and you want to hold him, fine. I get it. Wait for a good matchup. But I just don't think this week is it. 
Yeah, I hear that. I actually, I love that Anthony Jennings call. I haven't really looked into him too much this season, but I I, I also thought it was going to be a huge bump for Uche with Judon going out, but to see Jennings be the the leader in edge rusher snaps last week, that's kind of eye opening a little bit. But um, moving on to the Raiders, uh, I'm going to say start Trayvon Morig. He's actually played quite well this season from the free safety position. I mean, he's averaging five tackles a game, which is a big bump from what he has been doing so far in his career. Um, I, I do love his, his ball skills. He's, he's got fantastic ball skills at playing that deep safety position. And the Patriots have been throwing a ton, mainly because they've been behind a ton, but I don't know that, that page that the Patriots offense is just ugly, ugly, ugly. I just don't like it, but Trayvon Morig, he's a, he's a smart player. He's a great player. I think he's a guy who could actually put up some good numbers this week. Uh, I'm also starting, this is kind of deep, and mostly just for defensive tackle required leagues, but uh, by little Nichols. Uh, he's got 11 tackles in his last three games, and the Patriots are in the top five in points allowed to defensive tackle, or the top 10 defensive points allowed to defensive tackles. So uh, Nichols could be a guy who, if you, you're just looking to get, like, a solid three, four tackles from a defensive tackle because you have to start him. This could be a great matchup for him. Also give you a quick shout out on Bilal Nichols. Um, by Bilal Nichols, I really should be saying his name correct. 7.6% uh, run stop percentage, which is nothing to scoff at. So if you needed a little bit more in your favor as far as telling him why he could be a, a good option, there you go. All right, let's go ahead and move on here to the Detroit Lions. At the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So it's the best matchup for defensive tackles. It is the number one best matchup for defensive tackles here against the Buccaneers. However, it's the worst matchup for defensive ends and a pretty bad matchup for linebackers. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to tell you to sit Aiden Hutchinson because quite frankly, I don't think Aiden Hutchinson cares about how bad of a matchup this is for defensive ends. He's going to do what he does best. But I will tell you to start Ali McNeil and possibly John Kaminsky, the two interior defensive linemen for the Lions, because this is such a strong matchup and this defensive line has been crushing it so far. I think there's, you know, we've we've said this on the pod so many times before, but that's because it's true. So I'm going to say it again. A rising tide raises all boats. And if you're on a defensive line that has a ton of talent, such as the Lions defensive line or the perfect examples really are the Eagles and the 49ers, but even still the Lions are up there in the NFC. Every single player has an opportunity to get a sack in this game. And I think that's especially true for the interior defensive linemen. So if you're in a defensive tackle required league and you're looking for a streamer, those two guys could be possibilities. However, I will also take any opportunity I can get to trash on Alex Anzalone. And so I will do that. Because this is the 27th best matchup for our linebackers, I, I'm just expecting some inefficiency from a guy that's already pretty inefficient. So there you go. Start somebody else over him. Not Jack Campbell, that's for sure, but anybody else. <laughs> Poor Alex Anzalone. Uh, no love for the guy. I mean, rightfully so. He's just destroying Jack Campbell's career. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Uh, with the Bucks, uh, I'm going to say start uh, slot corner Christian. Is it Izian? 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 I think it's that one. I, I don't know. I think it's right. Christian Izian, but I, Izian. I really couldn't tell you. I'll Google right. it while you're talking. Um, he's their their, their slot corner. Um, the Lions have been targeting uh, Sam Laporta a lot more recently. He's been very heavily involved in the passing game. Plus, you have Josh Reynolds, who plays a lot in the slot, moving the chains for for Jared Goff. So. Uh, I mean, he could be he could be in for a pretty busy day playing playing that slot role, um, and I know the safeties are a pretty good matchup against the Lions. I mean, they they give up the ninth most points to safeties, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of take a, a whim here and I'm gonna say sit Antoine Winfield. I love Antoine Winfield. Don't get me wrong; he's been playing fantastic this year, but um, He's he's one of the better blitzing safeties in the league, and uh, that that Lions offensive line is just so good. They're not susceptible to blitzing. Um, the Lions don't take enough deep shots for Winfield to make plays in the free safety position, so he, he would need to move up and play nickel more. But now that they have Izine playing nickel, 
I mean, I, I feel like Winfield's going to play deep too often, and with uh, Devin White and Levante David up in the middle, they're going to soak up all those David Montgomery that David Montgomery volume. So I, I just think this is a week Winfield doesn't have his his big weeks. It's just going to be a, a pedestrian, mediocre week for Antoine Winfield. Christian Izian, I just Izian. just got that. So sorry, I led you astray. That's you know what be really nice if that David Montgomery volume turned at least a little bit into some Jameer Gibbs volume, but <laughs> I think at this point, this preview episode every single week is just going to be me complaining about all my misses and fantasy. So I think we can go ahead and move on to the Arizona Cardinals at the Los Angeles Rams. So I'm also going to mention a cornerback to start, and this guy's Antonio Hamilton Sr. So first of all, this Rams offense is the fourth best matchup for cornerbacks, which you love to see. And Hamilton's actually been getting some more work recently as recently as this past week, he was up at like a, I don't know, like a 70 something percent snap share. I didn't actually math it out. So he was at like 60 something out of 80 something, but he was splitting time between the slot and out wide. And that gives me optimistic about his tackle floor because he's now second on the team in snaps from the cornerback position behind only, I think it was Marco Wilson, but Marco Wilson plays entirely on the outside well, almost entirely on the outside. And so his tackle floor is a little bit lower. So I'll let you guys decide, you know, how you feel in your specific league, if you prefer pass deflections or whatever, because Marco Wilson gets targeted a little bit more. But either way, I like this matchup for cornerbacks, and I would like to throw Cardinal in there. And so I'm going to mention Antonio Hamilton, uh, a guy that I will tell you to sit. And I know this name is hard to pronounce. It's probably even harder to spell off of my pronunciation, but I had to look this one up ahead of time for a podcast, and it's Andre Sachere. No, I still screwed it up. It's Andre Sachere. It's like C-H-A-C-H-E-R-E. He's the Cardinals' current free safety filling in for Buda Baker. The Rams' offense is the worst matchup for safeties in all of football, and I don't think you should be starting Andre Sachere. Okay, fine. I get it. He's probably not even rostered in your league. And if he is, you're definitely not starting him. But I I just have a hard time telling people to sit Kayvon Wallace because he's been doing so well. But it really depends on the depth of your league. If you're looking for like a safety three or a safety four. Yeah, you could probably do some someone better than Kayvon Wallace. But like, look, I understand if you're in a tough league and you really, really need to start Wallace. I get it. Um but don't look to Andre Sachere as your uh, alternative option, I guess is what I can say. Uh, I like that. I've actually never even considered starting him, to be honest with you. But uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, going with the, the Rams, I don't really like this. I, I This Rams defense, I it's kind of uh, mind-blowing to me because I, I looked at them this season and I said, that team's going to be absolutely terrible. I just looked at all through that depth chart and I was like, I don't see other than Ernest Jones, Aaron Donald and Jordan Fuller. I don't see anybody on that team that really kind of like gets me excited, but um, I'm going to say, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to say sit the, I'm going to say sit Christian Roseboom. I know he might be a guy if you're starting in your deep leagues, he might be an LB three LB four. He's been, he's been okay. He's, He's been solid but unspectacular. Twenty-seven tackles on the season, but uh, he d- he did have a lingering neck injury, and now he's popped up with a thigh injury, and he is questionable. So, I'm I'm just gonna sit him. Like I, I don't want to worry about starting a guy who's second linebacker on the team, not even a and every down linebacker with lingering injuries. So just just sit him. Um, start Jordan Fuller mainly because Rosemum's beat up. And uh, Ernest Jones just popped up today on the injury report, too. I didn't yet get to see what it was for. But if Ernest Jones is limited or he's banged up, you have Roseboom who's banged up. Jordan Fuller is an excellent tackling strong safety, and he actually played very well last week. And I've been kind of waiting for that to happen. But going against the Cardinals and Josh Dobbs, I mean, it's just a good match. I think it's a good matchup for Fuller, especially if his linebackers are limited. Totally agree. I think the Steelers of old, I, I've still never like proven this theory, but I'm just going to roll with it because it feels right. The Steelers of old allowed Minka Fitzpatrick to be so productive because they had nobody at linebacker. And it just makes sense. Like if your linebackers are bad or like even last year, Jalen Petrie with the the garbage in front of him, like 
if you have bad linebackers that miss tackles, that's going to leave the safeties in a position to make the play instead. So it makes sense. If if you're left with like Christian Roseboom as your linebacker one, and what, like Jake Hummel as your linebacker two, like I just, you know, somebody's got to get the tackles and it's probably not going to be those guys. So I don't have too much else to add here. I'm cooling a little bit on rookie edge. Uh, like I still like the guy. He's still like a 15% pass rush win rate. It's just, not quite as high as it used to be, but he's making plays. He's getting pressures. So, I, you know, he's a rookie. He was drafted late. I'm not out here saying he's a bust by any means. I just beforehand, I was like, oh, my gosh, this guy is insane. And now I'm just like, all right, this guy's pretty good. But I'm not out here saying, you know, this is some ideal matchup by any means. So let's go ahead and move on to our next game with the Philadelphia Eagles at the New York Jets. So, listeners, you get it. You know my process. I'm going to make this easy for you. The Jets' offense is the 28th best matchup for linebackers and the 30th, the 30th, excuse me, best matchup for cornerbacks. So basically just knock those guys down a little bit. But I'm actually going to talk about some safeties here, and I'm going to tell you to sit Justin Evans and Terrell Edmonds. Now, I understand I'm probably the only person insane enough to ever have considered starting either of those guys at any point this season, but this is not the week to start either of them because... They're actually rotating starting responsibilities. I was trying to figure out why Justin Evans started last week, and I was like, huh, maybe Terrell Edmonds was injured. But no, Terrell Edmonds played special team snaps, so he was healthy. He just didn't play a single defensive snap. And I think it's really, really tough to trust Justin Evans in that starting role because who's to say that he starts again this upcoming week? Like, unless you hear verbatim out of the coach's mouth, Justin Evans is our starter rolling with him. I I don't really think that I'm too passionate about throwing in my starting lineup. And another guy that I'm not too passionate about throwing in my starting lineup, unfortunately, is Nick Morrow, which is tough because I have a lot of him in best ball. He's had some really, really great games so far this season. But listeners, remember when Nicobe Dean got injured? And beforehand, it was Nicobe Dean and Zach Cunningham starting side by side on the field. Then Nicobe Dean got hurt. They brought in Nick Morrow, and then he started scoring points. Well, Nicobe Dean is back, or at least he will be soon. Will he be back for week six? It's to be determined, but it's looking like he might be, and so you need to pay attention to that because as soon as Nicobe Dean is back, I have to assume, just based on what we've seen so far, that it's going to return to Nicobe Dean and Zach Cunningham starting with Nick Morrow being a bench asset, if not just being released outright like he was before. So... Don't start him. Plus, it's a bad linebacker matchup anyways, so why would you? Yeah, I like all that. Justin Evans, I, he's kind of like crazy to me. He, I, I was big on him when he was back in Tampa Bay, and then injuries happened. He went to New Orleans for a little bit, and he just kind of disappeared. And I was amazed to see him pop up in Philly this year and actually saw, seeing him play some meaningful snaps. It kind of blew my mind, but good for him. Um. All right, we're moving to the Jets. Uh, there's not much I really like about this Jets defense, especially in this matchup. But uh, I would say start a safety, but you're you're going to start Jordan Whitehead no matter what. I mean, that guy's been playing lights out this year. And uh, I'm not really too confident in Tony Adams, so I'm going to stay away from the safeties, even though it's a good matchup. Uh, I will say start Jermaine Johnson. Uh, he's been playing very well this year. He's been the most consistent uh, edge defender for the Jets. Uh Hurt's been sacked seven times in the past two games, and Johnson's been rocking a 62% snap share on the season, and he's pretty much a stud in the run game. He's he's powerful, he's strong, he can tackle. So I think uh, with that with that strong rushing game containing Jalen Hurts and uh, the fact that Hurts has been sacked seven times in the past two games gives Jermaine Johnson a nice floor. Um, I'm also going to say start uh, DJ Reed. He plays across from Sauce Gardner, who is one of the best cover corners in the league. And he's going to match up with either Devonta Smith or AJ Brown on the outside. Uh, they both they've combined for 41% of Jalen Hurts' target share, so there's going to be targets thrown his way. So I would say fire up DJ Reed. I love it. That's exactly the process that managers should take when looking to stream the cornerback position, which is also why you probably shouldn't spend too much to invest in it because you can get guys like this for really really cheap. 
Let's go ahead and move on here to Sunday night football with the New York Giants against the Buffalo Bills. Oh, baby, what a lights out matchup that's going to be. Only a 14 point spread. Oh, man. I apologize in advance for what you guys will be forced to watch with your families on Sunday night. Uh, hey, consider like going for a walk, um, watching the sunset, um, watching paint dry. Uh, if you're a Bills fan, I guess maybe you'll enjoy this, but that's going to be a tough game to watch. So I apologize in advance. Also, the Bills offense is the 28th best for defensive ends. Basically, not a great matchup. I'm going to keep it brief here. Sit Kayvon Thibodeau, sit Aziz Ojolari. I like both of these players as talents, but this is not the matchup for them. And they've been letting me down quite a bit this season as somebody who's been pretty heavily invested in both of them. I really wanted to see more at this point. I know Kayvon has actually had some spike weeks recently, but trust me, it has not been due to consistently powerfully good play. It's been kind of fluky and kind of lucky, like converting on very, very few pressures. Like some players will get as many as seven to 10 pressures in a game and not get a single sack. And then Kayvon's out here like one or two pressures and just happening to get a sack on that. So I just, I'm not going to gamble on that this week against the Bills in a really bad matchup. I'm glad to see Aziz Ojolari working back and getting healthy. In a better matchup, I will be more confident in starting him, but that is not this week. Yeah, I think Aziz Ojolari getting healthy will mean a lot for Kayvon Thibodeau, too. I think having both of them on the field healthy makes each other better. So I, I think that it'll it'll be good to see Aziz Ojolari healthy. I mean, I have a, plenty of shares of him as well. So I really would love to see him get healthy. But I think it'll also improve Kayvon Thibodeau as well. Um, what if the real pass rush win rate was the friends we made along the way? <laughs> <laughs> we would all be studs oh for sure uh, looking at the bills i have a, a kind of a deep deep sleeper start here for uh your ideal or defensive tackles uh jordan phillips right so he he's normally just a uh he's he's depth for the team uh it's usually ed oliver and uh, daquan jones starting uh, daquan jones is likely to be out for a few weeks now so uh, phillips is actually being thrust into a starting role. And uh, the last time he faced a terrible offensive line was in week three against the commanders. He was able to put up four pressures in limited snaps. So his snaps are going to increase. The giants have allowed 30 sacks on the season. They have a very good defensive line. So, I mean, Ed Oliver has been absolutely balling out recently. So it's going to, all the attention is going to be on him. So this is a super deep call, but I'd love to see I if you have, no, if there's, there's nothing left and you need somebody, you're just looking to stream somebody, Jordan Phillips. Um, start or I'm um, sorry, sit Jordan Poyer. Unfortunately, over the past, probably from 2022 to now, the Bills have played a lot of cover, more cover two than they have than they did before when you saw Poyer coming down with 100 plus tackles per season. Uh, he's playing a lot more deep and, uh, his linebackers have just been swallowing up tackles. Terrell Bernard, even Tyrell Dodson, when he came in yesterday, he was swallowing up tackles. And uh, there's the potential this week that the Giants are going to be starting Tyrod Taylor. And I don't think they're going to be pushing the ball downfield at all. So sitting in that cover two spot is just kind of going to be no man's land for Jordan Poirier this week. Yeah, and, and on the topic of the Bills, I you mentioned him already, but I have to give a shout out to Tyrell Dodson because... Matt Milano's likely out for the season. We've already seen with Terrell Bernard just how productive this linebacker position can be in Buffalo. You probably missed out on him already because this is you're probably going to hear this on a Thursday. Waivers already ran. But if for whatever reason, Tyrell Dodson is still available in your league and you're in a league where most all other full-time starting linebackers have been rostered, you need to pick him up because I think there's a very, very good chance that he fills in for Matt Milano and plays a full-time role. There's a non-zero chance that Doreen Williams splits time with him or even wins the job outright, but I think it's more likely that he plays a full-time role than either of those other two situations. 
What do you think about that before I move on to the next one? Oh, I really like it. Uh, Dodson's actually a guy I, I drafted in a ton of best ball leagues this year. I mean, it, there was there was the potential he was going to beat up Bernard for that starting job. I mean, that was a legitimate battle. So the fact that Milano's going to be out for the season now and you have Dodson now, now it was the two guys you saw battling out are going to be the guys who are just enjoying themselves. I mean, you have two young guys, just nobody really had too much stock into just playing well. Exactly. Just two two dudes being bros. You know what I mean? Yeah, throwing out. Exactly. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to Monday Night Football, our final game of the episode with the Dallas Cowboys at the Los Angeles Chargers. And I'll be talking about the Cowboys here. Now, first off, this matchup here against the Chargers offense is the 32nd best against linebackers. That's fancy for worst. It is the worst matchup for linebackers, but it is the second best matchup for cornerbacks. So I'll give you some bad news and then I'll give you some good news. And I think we can end on a high note there. Um, I'm going to mention Damone Clark. And it's a really weird transaction for me because on one hand, it's a bad matchup for linebackers. But on the other hand, Leighton Van Der Esch just got a neck injury, which you hate to see, especially knowing him. But that neck injury is going to leave an opportunity for Damone Clark to see more snaps, to see more tackles. He's been a pretty efficient player so far this season, so you'll like to see that. So here's here's what I want listeners to kind of process here. Look at Damone Clark, Clark's game logs in your league. Give it a slight boost because now he's going to play more snaps. And then give it a slight dip down because it's a bad matchup. <laughs> Sounds good. Cool. Glad we're on the same page. If that looks exciting to you, great. You can throw them in your lineup. If that's not quite enough, great. Wait for next week when they've got a better matchup because anything is better than the worst matchup in football. However, I will, like I said, end on a high note and mention that you should start Duran Blanche. Now, the easiest, most cliche pun I can make of all time is that, yeah, I understand this is relatively bland take, but it's a great matchup for cornerbacks. Duran Bland has been given pretty good usage. He doesn't have a ton of pass rush upside, but like he has some. So there's a non-zero chance that he happens to get a sack in this game. You never know. It's better than like somebody who just gets zero pass rush use whatsoever. So I'll take a little bit. And really, I just like it because it's a solid matchup. I understand you could also start Stefan Gilmore, but like he's Stefan Gilmore. He's a popular name. So I'm not really going to come out here and spend time talking about him. But Deron Bland is a guy that's probably not as popular. So that's why I'll mention him. Yeah, Durant Bland's been playing well this year, too. I, I'm a big fan of Bland. And Damone Clark, he's finished last season really strong. So with added opportunity, he could he could actually be a guy who finishes the season on fire. So I, I like both of those. Uh, looking at the Chargers, I uh, got two starts. Um, so they give up the most points to linebackers. So you're probably already starting Garrett Kendricks in your league. So I'm going to say go ahead and start Kenneth Murray. So Kenneth Murray was a guy that... I think people were starting to write off too, but I even thought when Eric Hendricks comes back, he played fantastic while Eric Hendricks was out, at least for fantasy purposes. He's, his his efficiency still wasn't great, but I mean, he's he was drafted the first round and he just he fell out of favor with the coaching staff. He lost his starting jobs, and he just you thought you had an opportunity this year, and then they went and they they signed Eric Kendricks and. He literally has been playing almost every single snap. I mean, even when Eric Kendricks came back from injury, he still played 100% of the snaps. So you have the Cowboys who give up the most points to linebackers. Uh, he's actually, his tackle grades haven't been great this year, but he has graded pretty well in coverage and in pass rushing. So that keeps him on the field. So start Kenneth Murray in a good matchup. I'm also saying start Asante Samuel. Uh, he has 12 tackles and three pass deflections in the last two games. This was the Samuel I was hoping to see who played so fantastic at the end of last season and in the playoffs. Uh, the Cowboys also target outside wide receivers often. Um, and Dak Prescott has been known to have some pretty questionable decision-making. So I think uh, this could be another big week for Asante Samuel. I like it. Oh, man, I'm... I'm so excited for Eric Hendricks this week. I, I think this is kind of the perfect parlay into our listener questions. So how about I just like hold off on my hype and then we just get right into it. So listener questions. 
Listeners, if you guys have start sit questions that you would like to submit to the episode, you can do so at the idpshow.com. Every week before this episode is recorded, we put out a start sit thread where premium subscribers are able to put in their start sit questions. So if you ever are in a tough spot and not sure who to throw in your lineup, or you just have any random question that you want us to answer on the show, feel free to shoot your question over onto the idpshow.com. All right. This first question here comes in from CD, and he needs two out of the four linebackers. And his options are Levante David, Eric Kendricks, Pete Warner, Caden Ellis. I It's Pete Werner. I really should have spelled corrected this individual. Sorry to call you out live on the air. Pete Werner, Caden Ellis. Before I answer the second question, I'll answer the first one. Personally, for me, Eric Kendricks is a lock in the number one best matchup for linebackers in a full-time role. And I really like Pete Werner because he's a, I believe, a more efficient tackler than Caden Ellis, and Levante David is in a poor matchup. So um, do, do you have any additional thoughts there? This, I mean, really, when I look at these, it's like all of these guys play a full-time role, so it's not a matter of how many snaps they're going to see. It's more of a matter of how good their matchup is and how efficient they are. What do you think here? Yeah, I actually I went with Werner and Kendricks as well. I just think Werner is... No offense to Ellis, Werner is just a better player. He just seems a lot more consistent. I mean, he's seen the playing time and he's been productive. Caden Ellis, surprisingly, he's seen a dip in his production in the past few weeks. I mean, he's still a full time player, but and he has a really good matchup against Washington. But he just he seems like he's been inconsistent this year. And Werner is a guy who has been consistent. Plus, Kendricks has the best matchup, so I'm going with the same too. I wonder if Caden Ellis's dip in production coincides with Troy Anderson's injury. I'll have to look into that, but I'd be curious. Maybe they're using him in a less efficient way simply right. because they need him to do more on the field. Oh, that, that definitely could be, the, be it for sure. Yeah. That, that also probably doesn't mean good things for him going forward either, because I think Troy Anderson's done for the year. I don't know if you know this off the dome. I don't know off the top of my head, but I don't think it was good. Yeah, I know he's definitely out for, you know, at least the four weeks that he's on IR for, if not more. But anyways, that wasn't the question. The second question CD asked is, is Jalen Carter safe to start in DT required leagues? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you handle this softball. Go ahead and just yes. add it out of the park. Yes. Yes, the dude's a beast. He's an absolute beast. I mean, number one, he's on the best pass rushing rotation in the league. He's got a running mate in Jordan Davis who can also collapse the pocket. He's got one of the best edge rushing rotations in the league. It's yeah, definitely hundred percent. Yeah. Jalen Carter. I was actually just listening to the PFF NFL podcast earlier today where they were talking about this exact thing. Jalen Carter is doing something unprecedented, just okay. Not unprecedented, but just like unbelievable. It's so rare that a player comes into the draft with expectations as high as we had for, for a player of his caliber and still completely destroys them. Mm -hmm. And Jalen Carter is doing absolutely that. He's already up there in like the the Aaron Donald, Chris Jones tier. Like, not that it's one tier, but like it's Aaron Donald at one and Chris Jones at two. And like Jalen Carter is kind of up there just like swimming around in that range already. So, so yeah, he's, he's a start in DT required leagues for sure, for sure. And it's crazy to see him do it as a rookie because you see it like the defensive lines, a lot of time that's a position where it takes – players a year or two to get acclimated to the NFL and he just he looks like he's been a veteran for years he's just dominating absolutely okay let's go ahead and move on to our next question this comes in from Donald S any rest of season concerns with Kyle Duggar still a weekly start or a matchup streamer or perhaps just a temporary hold on having him in lineups the Pats are a dumpster fire and his tackle totals are concerning now personally for me I would at least hold him off this week because it's not a great safety matchup. However, he still has solid usage. He's still getting a lot of snaps and invaluable parts of the field. So I'd wait for the Patriots to turn things around and then he should be decent again, you know, kind of use him as a matchup play. I don't anticipate the Patriots being this consistently bad. Um, but their stretch coming up here doesn't look too great either, unless I'm... No, I might be getting them mixed up with the Vikings. But either way, I expect them to turn it around at some point, and I know DBs are volatile, so maybe not this week, but I definitely am not dropping him in, in moderate to deep leagues. 
Yeah, I'm definitely not dropping him, but I'd I'd use him as a matchup streamer. I mean, he's he's been kind of disappointing this season, but like you said, his usage and where he's being used is exactly what you're looking for for a safety. It's just it hasn't converted to production for him. So it's the team's kind of in shambles right now. So we just need to I think we'd need to wait wait out the past to see is it continue gonna continue just to be a dumpster fire or are they gonna turn around a little bit? I mean it's Bill Belichick, so you you have that thing in the back of your head saying, well, they're going to turn around at some point. I mean, it's Bill Belichick's team, but at the same time you have that thought, well, it's Bill Belichick's team. Can I trust a defensive player on his team? So use Duggar as a matchup streamer and uh, wait to see if this team turns it around. Yeah, absolutely. Donald S also has one more question. Uh, thoughts on potentially rolling out both CJ Mosley and Quincy Williams. If you have both in a given week, Both have been really productive. Now, I kind of was talking about this a little bit last week with a different team. I think it was the 49ers, potentially. It's it's a tricky thing with linebackers because normally I I I hearken the situation back to like linebacker handcuffs, right? Only one guy can be a full time player and you're not better off handcuffing your own linebacker, but rather handcuffing somebody else's line or sorry, handcuffing somebody else's running back so that you could end up with two full-time starters or in the same way that you probably wouldn't start two wide receivers from the same team, because every time the ball is thrown, only one wide receiver can catch it. Mm -hmm. But there are some situations where that is acceptable. So on the offensive side of the ball, it's like, well, you would probably want to start two wide receivers from a good team. Like, right. You'd want to start AJ Brown and Devonta Smith over, you know, AJ Brown and Juju Mm Smith-Schuster. So it's like, you know, there there is some lenience here. And it's so ultimately it comes down to how productive is that position group as a whole? How many snaps does that defense play? And how good is their matchup? And I haven't done a deep enough dive on this to know if you actually are limiting your ceiling. So until that time comes, really, I'm just going to look at both of these players as individual assets. And just say that there is some slight correlation between the two, but not enough to really decide one way or another. So until something says otherwise, and they're both performing well, I personally would be totally comfortable putting them both in a starting lineup. I 100% agree. I mean, they have both been incredibly productive this year. And if you if you look at uh, Coach Salah's uh, teams throughout the years, I mean, that's kind of been the thing. It's been two linebackers, pretty productive. Uh, he was in um, Seattle when he was starting up, and then he moved went to the 49ers, and then now here in uh, New York. And I mean, Quincy Williams and Mosley have both been productive this year, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep riding it out. I mean, Mosley's your your kind of your coverage guy, and Quincy's just kind of all over the place. Honestly, the, that dude's always around the ball. So I I do like both. They do have slightly different roles, and but I do think both can continue continue to be productive. Awesome. All right. Our last question comes in from Blaine Broughton. Uh, forgive me if I pronounced your name wrong. I'm doing my best. Um, <laughs> and they ask thoughts on Julian Love. Well, I coincidentally talked about Julian Love earlier on this episode. Uh, Blaine says, quietly has been great for me, but does Jamal Adams and Diggs starting have implications for his usage is he going to be in on third down snaps i'm kind of paraphrasing here because i i'm apparently terrible at reading off a script on an episode uh but yeah i this week is going to be really really telling this is going to be the first time that we see uh jamal adams quandre Diggs, and julian love all share the field for the entirety of the game hopefully and it's gonna it's gonna be very informative on their usage going forward I my prediction is we see Quandre Diggs continue to play that full deep safety role, and then I think I, I'll I'll give an idea here for the range of outcomes because Blaine, I I think you would probably prefer that instead of me just making a prediction. Um, the best case scenario I think for Julian Love is that he continues to be a full time player, and Jamal Adams comes in in sub packages. The likelihood that that happens is probably like ten percent. The worst case scenario for Julian Love is that he's completely off the field and is strictly a backup, and Jamal Adams just completely takes over that role. The likelihood that that happens is also probably only like 10%. 
what I think the median outcome here, what I think is most likely is that those two players will probably split time situationally. And both of them probably see anywhere between like 40 and 60% of snaps on a weekly basis. But again, predictions are one thing. Seeing it happen is another thing entirely. And so what I would do is I would just start somebody that I know is going to play a full-time role and just wait it out on Julian Love and see how it looks. Or better yet, if you can, sell Julian Love to a team that thinks he's going to continue to produce at the rate that he's been producing and then move on. Because I think that the likelihood that he continues to produce at or above the level that he's been producing so far this season is basically zero. Yeah, I I agree there. Um, the the one thought that I had on Julian Love, like with, with Jamal Adams coming back, Diggs is obviously that he's the free safety starter. I think Jamal Adams comes in and he's going to be the strong safety. Now, my thoughts is I know Kobe Bryant has been pretty decent in the slot playing the nickel corner, but Julian Love, when he first came into the NFL with New York, he actually played nickel corner for a while. And he was a, in college at Boston College. He was he was an outside corner. He played safety. He played nickel. He played all over the de- the defensive back. So I'm wondering, is Julian Love, is there the potential of him moving into the nickel role and moving Kobe Bryant to the to the bench and then that having Love, Adams, and Diggs on the field all the time? And that's truly speculation. But I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that teams like to have their best players on the field at all times. And if Julian Love is, if they consider him one of their best players, do they move him into that nickel role? So I think for now, we have to wait to see how this plays out. I mean, you... you I'd sit on Julian Love. If you can sell him, I mean, it's a defensive back. If you can sell a defensive back, do it because, I mean, you, you can find one off where you could probably sell Julian Love and then just go pick up Quandre Diggs. But sell Julian Love if you can. Otherwise, wait out the situation, see how usage goes, and see where these guys are lining up. Yeah, okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the week four PFF game log here, and what I'm seeing is Devon Witherspoon – played 100% of defensive snaps, and he played primarily as their slot cornerback. Oh. Tariq Woolen played on the outside, and Michael Jackson was the other player on the outside. Um, Now, let's see here. Looking at... Looking at Jamal Adams, he played nine snaps... Two in the box, six in the slot, and one at wide corner versus Julian Love saw his pretty typical strong safety usage, mm. box slot, or sorry, box and free safety mostly, a little bit in the slot. So, uh, yeah, this is, th- there are so many things that could happen. This is really just, you know, un- unprecedented territory. So, we're just going to have to see. Uh, but I will say, Jamal Adams technically was the starter. And Michael Jackson technically was not the starter. So is there a chance that maybe the intent was for Jamal Adams to start over Michael Jackson? I don't really think so. I don't think that a starter or a player, quote unquote, being a starter really means anything. It just means they were on the field for the first snap of the game. Right. So I probably won't give too much weight to that. But the fact that Jamal Adams played the majority of his snaps in the slot means something. And against the Giants, maybe they just had a matchup against Darren Waller. I don't know. I could probably look that up, but I don't care enough to find out. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next question, unless you've got anything else to add here. That's good. Awesome. All right. Final question. Also from Blaine. What is going to happen in Dallas? Damone Clark time. Seems like a decent chance to get some tackles for whoever steps in for LVE. So coincidentally, I also talked about this already. So you've pretty much heard my thoughts. Anything to add aside from what we already talked about? No, I'm like I said, I'm a big Damone Clark fan. I, I love to see it. Awesome. Okay, so Blaine, if you just skipped all the way to the end of the episode just to hear us answer your questions, first of all, shame on you. But luckily, uh, the New York Giants were the last team. The New York Giants, Dallas Cowboys, sorry, Cowboys Chargers. Wow, I can't read. Cowboys Chargers was the last game we talked about. So just go rewind. I talked about Damone Clark there. Save yourself the time. Awesome. All right, Joey, this was a really fun episode. We cranked this baby out in an hour and 20 minutes for 15 games. I got to say, man, that was that was pretty impressive. It it was it was flowing. It was going good. It was definitely going good. Yeah, it's me after breakfast usually, but (laughs) 
<laughs> Anyways, um, we're going to go ahead and call it here. Listeners, you know the drill. If you have questions about this episode, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at IDP Evan or Joey at Joey the Tooth IDP, or I guess on X, whatever you prefer to call it. I don't really care. Uh, but thank you so much for listening. We will see you on the next episode, or at least I will, and, and I'll be joined by whoever I'm joined by. But Jake, Joey, wow. All the names, all the names that start with a J. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to record this with you as I'm scrolling through finding all my buttons. Uh, we'll catch you on the next one. And until then, peace out. And now it's time to go, because you were about to roll with the IDP show.